Hello, everyone. I'm excited to see so many people still so late in the afternoon. Let's do a quick poll. Who here watches eSports? Great. I'm surprised. How many has heard about eSports? Great. We're in for a great talk then. Good. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of context and read, and read a part from Newsu's newest report, and then we'll jump into it. So eSports has been one of the hottest topics on, in gaming for the past couple of years, with strong growth in viewership and revenue. In 2018, the global eSports audience will reach over 380 million people, according to Newsu. And if I read directly from Newsu's amazing eSports report, as a consumer phenomenon, eSports continues to grow its huge base of passionate fans across the globe. As a business, eSports is now entering a new and critical phase towards maturity. Big investments have been made, new league structures have been launched, sponsorship budgets have moved from experimental to continuous, and international media rights trade is starting to heat up. So, Eunice, Jens, both of you are very much in the middle of esports, and I would really love to hear your take on this. Are the days of crazy growth already behind us, and have we reached an era of maturity in esports, or are we just getting started? Please. <laughs> We're definitely seeing the beginning of a very positive trend for all of us. And you know, not only have we seen the viewership and the growth increase in the last several years, in the last year alone, it's been exponential. We've seen increased stability in the space with the creation of three very stable esports franchise leagues, which have helped advertisers really understand the space a little bit more. And really, you know, with a lot of the robustness and the higher bar borrow standards that we're setting across the board, it's really forcing companies to think about how to scale, how to formalize things, and how to really work together to become a real industry in the mainstream space. So it's definitely a very good start for us. So I think when, when sort of addressing or, or reading the statement that you just read, it's, it's a bit like, People read in the media, in the gaming media, and the general media that esports has been sort of exploding the last months or the last one or two or three years. Um, I'd say esports has always been growing on a pretty continuous basis for the last 20 years, actually. Um, esports fundamentally being competitive multiplayer gaming, esports fundamentally being the kind of um, beauty of watching video gamers perform and kind of understanding as that as the beauty of spectation of, of video games in a competitive way. Um, it has been growing for, for more than two, three, four decades now. Actually started in 1975 in the arcades in the US. Um, so kind of this trend of kind of playing video games competitively and enjoying the spectation of it has been going on for a long time. It just simply has hit this inflection point of finally audience filling up stadiums. And when sort of there was 10,000 people for the first time in a big stadium, kind of the general media opened up their eyes and like, hey, here's eSports, there's a real boom happening. Right now, all, the, all these people are suddenly there. No, they're not suddenly there, they were always there. Just all of a sudden, they fill a stadium while a year before, the stadium was maybe 70% capacity, right. right? So I think kind of there was an inflection point that made many people believe like here's a boom going on. The reality is, Esports is growing and, and kind of flourishing with new generations growing up with video games, with a natural understanding that video games are a spectator sport. There's athletes that perform well at these kind of video game sports, and that will not change from here on forward. So video games and esports will continue to grow, in my opinion, on a pretty linear basis, even though the last two years have seen the biggest investment going into esports, with sort of esports hitting this sort of, it's a level to mainstream today, I think we can call it pop culture even. Right. Actually, to kind of follow up a little bit on that, if, if we talk a little bit more about the money in, in esports, um, global esports revenues are, exp are forecasted to reach 906 million this year, with year on year growth of 38%. You're an investor in the space, Jens, and, and I really bet the audience would love to hear your view on this. Like, who makes the money and where does it go in esports? I mean, first and foremost, the um, people who develop these games um, that we play today and nowadays 
have been starting to make the most money out of this. And by money, I mean revenue and profits as a result of that. Um, but as these kind of the spectation element, the kind of entertainment aspect of esports started to rise the last kind of decades, particularly the last years, we're seeing other businesses build out this entire ecosystem and starting to get to a point where they're becoming viable businesses, which is esports teams, independent esports leagues, kind of we've invested in betting in esports, in trading card games in esports, in sort of analytics and, and sort of coaching and training in esports, um, in fashion and apparel in esports, even in music in esports. All these different kind of pieces of what is becoming a next generation entertainment, a next generation sports industry are becoming viable businesses with the fundamental and underlying growth. But the biggest piece so far has certainly been taken by those who develop these games and own these games. And by the way, by comparison, there's nobody out there who owns the IP of basketball or mm -hmm. soccer, right? If that person would be out there, he would be the one making the most out of kind of the traditional sports, right? right? There's not. So in, in, in gaming, that's different because there's people that own the, own the underlying IP. Um, but it would also be kind of hardware manufacturers. The Logitechs, the Turtle Beaches, kind of that have been making um, a very good living um, of producing equipment that helps our electronic athletes to perform better. Right. Actually, Eunice, I would kind of love to hear your view on view on this. As uh, Cloud9 is ranked the most valuable esports company by Forbes earlier this year, and also named the esports organization of the year by the esports award. Um, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> um, but from, from your viewpoint, can you tell us about the monetization strategy for Cloud9 and how you've been able to grow your business steadily year over year? As a team owner organization, our revenue streams and pillars are built into our sponsorships as one of our biggest platforms, and merchandise, advertising, and media rights. We also work with the franchises to get revenue shares from that. With sponsorships, it's been a very interesting challenge to see how we educate our partners in the process of getting them into entering the market. So a lot of the complexity of how a brand can enter the market is very unknown right now. There's no clear path. Um, a lot of the traditional ways of, of advertising in other industries don't necessarily apply here because we have a very different platform. We have different diff consumption types of basis. We have a different fan base that is very ad resistant. So there's been a lot of work done on our end um, and hopefully across the industry that I've seen um, to, to really make sure that brands are being educated the right way so that they don't churn and have a bad experience as an early adopter. And um, throughout the years, it's, it's been interesting because now we're figuring out, OK, where do we focus our ways? Where do we focus our resources? Where do we scale in these different areas? A lot of the areas that I mentioned, for example, merchandise, media rights, a lot of that has been tapped into on a very basic level. But we haven't thought about you know, additional licensing rights or creating new content from a lot of the, the licenses that we have to offer. Um, we haven't really thought more about how to make merch into something that is more of a lifestyle brand, where other teams may have, and they, they've been very successful. Um, for us, it's something that we really need to put resources against and, and think about. Um, but at a very high level, you know, I, I think there's a lot of work to be done, and it's, it's really exciting to see in the industry grow and with Cloud9 to grow alongside it. Right. Um, if we stick a little bit to the, to the advertising component, I was doing a little bit of research on the internet. I hope my statistics are correct. Um, but if you look at the eSports sponsorship and advertising revenues, um, it, it will surpass half a billion dollars this year, which is roughly at the same level as, as Super Bowl ad money. But then if you look at the viewership, eSports is double that of, of the Super Bowl. So are there advertisers? Are they investing? Are they not investing? And how do we get more advertisers into eSports? So um, particularly this year, we have seen a lot of FMCGs um, um, kind of move into esports as their advertisement platform, as part of their advertisement strategy. We've seen um, um, uh, T-Mobile. We've seen Deutsche Post. We've seen DHL. Um, we've seen um, um, a couple of airlines coming in. So it's, it's kind of, I think we're seeing major brands, major FMCGs moving in right now. The fundamental barrier that some of them still have is number one, how do I truly and authentically kind of communicate with that target audience? Um, number two, um, 
these games, to some extent, are sort of considered violent still mm -hmm. by some of them, where mm -hmm. I'm sometimes asking myself the question, like, if I switch on my TV set at 8 or 9 or even 7 p.m. in the evening, like, I see the same stuff. Like, I see more violent stuff than that. Like, you're advertising all around these kind of pictures. Like, how's League of Legends in any way a problem, right? But that is still something that the FMCGs have to get used to. And oftentimes, it's actually younger people get into a decision into decision maker um, positions in kind of the bigger agencies or in those um, um, uh, with those brands and and once the younger people move in with sort of having grown up with esports or having grown up with gaming it's a different conversation we're having right so, so I think and a lot of that is happening right now that sort of the younger generations are, are getting into decision maker positions in bigger agencies in kind of some of the FMCGs and, and are really making a difference right there and they're also the ones who can really structure the right campaigns in that target audience so I'd say we're we're we had a great year in 2018. If that continues, then we'll definitely step up the monetization game in advertisement and sponsorship in esports massively in the next years to come. Yeah, there's also a lot of interesting ways that we're thinking about it, at least with Cloud9, in terms of coming up with new inventory to really work with sponsors on and advertisers on. So, you know, typically right now we have a lot of very basic inventory, things like logos on jerseys and ad inventory on Twitch streams and, and different things like that, meet and greets, activations, a lot of things you see in regular sports industries or other industries. Um, two, two really strong goals for us at Cloud9 next year are one, figuring out our global expan expansion plan, and two, building new programming, for example, youth camps or summer leagues and, and things like that, uh, to really break into the more mainstream lifestyle in a way that not just you know, hardcore gamers can understand, but also casual gamers and their families. And with an increased audience in these new markets, hopefully we'll also be able to work with advertisers to explain that in more layman's terms. Yeah, it's, uh, very interesting points. I'm gonna shift gear a little bit away from money and, and to kind of talk, uh, talk more about technology, considering that Slush is a huge tech conference. And, um, and I think we often get stuck when we're talking about esports, only talking about games, but there's so much more other type of technology that goes into it, be it, be it the hardware or be it the Discord or, or Twitch or whatever. And you know, since we're in the, you know, the future driven <laughs> uh, uh, conference, I would love to hear your views on what kind of technology could elevate esports and, and kind of make it even better, be it, I don't know, rapid eye measuring tech or AI based, I don't know, something. Um, what kind of tech are you excited for? So I think when, when we looked at what companies can we invest in and, and should we invest in or should we build, then we looked at sort of two categories, stuff that has worked in the traditional sports space that can be rethought for esports and sort of um, kind of digitalized a bit more for the esports audience and then it would work in esports. And the other category is stuff that hasn't been around in traditional sports uh, to the biggest extent and can only work in esports because esports is fundamentally digital first and kind of based on video games. Um, so in these two buckets, there is um, quite some, some things that we've been excited about. I mentioned some of them to begin with, kind of um, betting around esports is a great sort of engagement tool for existing audiences, a great way for, for audience to connect deeper with the game and, and the game experience um, and the fandom around it. We've been kind of looking at the entire sort of space of merchandise, performance, nutrition, kind of um, services, talent management around esports, um, growing talent in esports, coaching and training of talent. In e um, and then a lot of this also gets reinvented in traditional sports. I'd say about four, five, six years ago, kind of sports tech, it's called, so the sports technology investments started in the traditional sports space and it would be kind of how do I better measure nutrition? How do I better measure certain performance aspects or sort of uh, certain body measures? Kind mm -hmm. of how do I optimize my training and whatnot? So a lot of these things will work in esports, uh, but they also only recently really took off in traditional sports, which is interesting to see. And I think that esports, to some extent, will sort of outperform and outpace innovation that we've seen in traditional sports, um, because we're truly kind of digital first. Right. What are the types of technologies that help Cloud9 players? <laughs> well, there's actually three different categories that I can think of that, that we really encompass at Cloud9. So on the business end, there's a lot of business tools that we absolutely 
need and will be needing as we grow and scale as a company. Uh, so things that help us gather data, things that help us you know, value our inventory to advertisers, uh, which advertisers and also like our league partners could find useful um, and, and really just provide a lot more analysis and, and valuation and, and management tools. And on the player end, on a pro player end, we actually could probably see a lot of use for deep tech, things like machine learning that our coaches could really use for prediction and analysis. Um, you know, things that also help improve our player performance, whether it's mental or diet or nutrition focus. Um, we've worked with a lot of partners. For example, Red Bull has a sleep program that we recently put one of our teams through, and it's been incredibly helpful. Um, and then there are other companies and startups that have reached out to us uh, where we, you know, one of their ideas was to measure our players' heart rates as they were you know, encountering different situations in, in gameplay and, and really taking that data to figure out, okay, what are they reacting to? What are they looking at? How fast are they reacting? And, and things like that that can really help performance. And, and the thirdly, on the, on the community end, you know, we as Cloud9 have a huge community, but we're always looking for ways to engage deeper, to potentially monetize, and you know, really just to figure out in different ways how to either segment them as regional communities or, or work with them on a, on a higher level, or you know, I, I don't even know what could be possible, but you know, let us know what's possible. But there's so many different ways for innovation that I think we're open to it. So it sounds like there's a lot of space for, for startups in, in eSports. <laughs> Absolutely. Actually, Jens, as an investor yourself, what are the types of KPIs you're looking at for investing in eSports startups specifically? I don't think we would look much differently than other investors in other spaces. Um, we look principally at team, product, market. Now market, in our case, you're always being eSports, but within eSports, like what's the certain segment that he's covering? Is he in apparel? Is he in gaming? Is he in B2B services? Is he in analytics? Like what is the market that he's serving? Um, and on these three sort of different aspects, we'd look for kind of, I'd say, two of those aspects to flash kind of bright green. Mm -hmm. um, so ideally, there's a great founder team with a great product. The market might not be there, but might be large enough tomorrow. Or great founder team, great market, product still sucks, but can be fixed. Like the, see, everything in perfect fit is rare, but that's kind of the three, I'd say, dimensions that we look at in the first place. What matters probably the most abstractly on top of that is passion for gaming. We've sort of rarely seen somebody doing really well who doesn't truly love playing League of Legends or Counter-Strike or Dota himself and truly understands the target audience and the space that he's working in. So kind of finding a founder who's truly passionate about what he does is definitely the criteria on top of that. But it sort of fa falls probably in the first bucket like team uh, as a qualification criteria for the person that's actually building here. Okay. And then what's the next big eSport? What's the next game? <laughs> I think this is one of those super large kind of startup opportunities. Um, like, like, again, first of all, thinking about how do you define esports? Again, esports fundamentally is kind of games that are competitive multiplayer video games, synchronous multiplayer video games, that are equally fun to play as they're fun to watch. Now, Understanding how to design from a game design perspective for a game to actually serve both of these aspects at the same time is something that is incredibly difficult. And I'd say a lot of the games that have made it in esports find their roots in game design principles that have not been put together because people did it that way because they thought a lot of people are going to watch it. They were done that way because, like, hey, it's great and it's fun. And then people actually discovered the watchability, and then sometimes it was a bit optimized for expectation. But I think there's a whole new level of art and mastery in game design, which is a person understanding, how do I design a game so that somebody can sit down in a stadium, and the game is made up in a way that there's 30, 40, 45 minutes of gameplay between two teams or two players, or maybe even several teams, 
define the game format, define the game define the game design that makes it so watchable in that in that kind of entertainment form, as well as really fun to play and really have su sufficient depth of gameplay. Mm -hmm. And it's so rare because it's not been learned. There's no best practices. There's no kind of really references of, like, I've designed a game specifically with both of the criteria in the right. first place and I've succeeded, right? So I think that is something that is just starting the last years to happen as people understand, hey, esports games have a certain kind of definition. And if I design for that, I could sit on a gold mine just like Riot or Wargaming or, or kind of um, um, any of the other kind of publishers and IP developers that have achieved that level of success because a successful esports game has a lifetime of more than 10 years. It's proven. Counter Strike is out there for close to 18 years now. Yeah. 18 years. Yeah. League of Legends is out there now for what, like eight years? Like, and it's probably yeah. going to be. Um, having a lifetime of two decades. Right. I don't see a reason why, why, why Riot Games would mess that up. Like, that's, that's something that you want to be able to achieve. And you can achieve that if you design along these principles. Right. But the mastery level is high. And I have not seen a lot of teams that have really dedicated themselves and thought that through beginning to end. And that is the biggest opportunity by far. Right. There are still genres that I haven't even thought about that are unexplored. Mm -hmm. Um, that shall be explored, just like nobody knew what the Battle Royale genre is five years right. ago, right? Somebody lifted it, and then two, three, four generations of developers and IPs later, the biggest one surfaces with Fortnite, right? 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 So and it I looks think like an overnight success, right? Because we yeah. just see we just see the yeah. one, right? And then, then yeah. there's um, kind of you stop me here when, when I'm taking too much time. Yes, then there's the, that's what I'm trying <laughs> to do. <laughs> the, the, the aspects of different <laughs> platforms, like mobile, has its very own characteristics in yep. esports. There's a specific way that you design for mobile. We have VR still in its infancy, but kind of. Think about what, what esports did. It basically traditional sports very physical. Mm -hmm. Esports very mental. What VR will probably do, not only with a deep level of immersion, but basically you using full body motion to some extent, VR might create the super sport. It might be the perfect combination of the mental depth that esports has with the, the physical. physical depth and kind of um, attributes that traditional sports has. VR might well create the sport that is the super sport combining both. So there's tremendous opportunity kind of on the different platforms with uh, kind of going deep on game design that are just, just really opening up right now. Eunice, I'm actually I'm sort of following up on this question. I'd like to hear your kind of take on, on what's the type of title that has the potential to become mainstream and we have, have it in the Olympics and then the players are in, on Oprah and, you know, what type of title will that be? We're seeing a lot of publishers approach esports in different ways. And I think with something like the Olympics, right, I, there's definitely a lot more focus on the journey of the athlete, their training, um, a lot of really uh, treating the esports athletes like they're professional players with a mental well being and a sports psychologist, with nutrition, with physical training but um, also just telling the story of how the athlete gets to their peak performance. And that can only really be achieved through a lot of structure, through an eSports format that really tells that story. So we've seen League of Legends and Overwatch, for example, with uh, you know, year-long seasons and, and culminating in a world championship at the end, and there's weekly structures and everything is really you know, legitimized and sort of credible and, and really gives the mainstream audience a sense of stability and understanding what's happening. Um, then on the other end of the extreme, obviously with Fortnite, for example, they really don't have any esports structure. They're really focused on pop, pop culture. And um, you know, we've even seen Ninja as the biggest Fortnite streamer on Ellen DeGeneres' show recently, uh, teaching her how to play the game. So you know, while that really doesn't have an esports focus, it's, it's one of the ways that gaming can get into the mainstream and really tap into that larger audience who can then care about you know, a form of esports in some time, some time down the line. And you know, hopefully we'll see the consumption model change a little bit as a lot more media outlets and a lot more mainstream pop culture channels become more interested in, in what's happening. Um, and, and I think this is, you know, it, both in, in both formats, it, you know, esports is really pushing gaming and other forms of esports forward. 
Um, actually, we, we're about to run out of time, but we have a question from the audience. Um, I'm going to read it out loud. How much does regional identity mean to esports teams' identities and brand? And even if you look at maybe broader than that, like the regional aspects of esports, we have one minute. Go. <laughs> uh, I could. Give a quick anecdote. So Cloud9, we actually own London Spitfire, which is our Overwatch team. Um, and it's been really an uh, interesting challenge for us to figure out how to have a European team uh, as, a, as a North American organization with a roster full of Korean players. Uh, so the regional identity is something that the Overwatch League really tried to push. And you know we've been working very closely with our local community to figure out how to engage deeper with them, throwing events in the local area, and um, also while tapping into the global audience that Overwatch League has provided, but also with our Korean national uh, players and, and our, our Cloud9 North American fans. Uh, so it's, it's, it's definitely a huge identity that I think more leagues are going to be pushing, but also more teams need to figure out as esports is a global phenomenon, so we need to make sure we're tapped into all the markets possible. I, I, I look at it in, in kind of two ways. There's, it definitely creates additional opportunity for the fans to interact with our team. It definitely creates additional opportunity to monetize because you have other kind of um, uh, sponsorship opportunities that you can realize in kind of a physical kind of local environment. Um, on the other hand side, what I love about esports and gaming and our games is really that we have been living in a space where boundaries don't matter. You play with a friend from France, you follow a team with five different players from all around the planet, kind of on a tournament in New York, your team is from Berlin, like that, that bound, geographical kind of boundaries don't matter in esports and gaming, I think is a beautiful thing. And I also think it's beautiful that esports team needed to define themselves by values in the first place and not by my city in the first place, right? And I think that's something beautiful because it, it forces you to, to live up to values. It forces you to communicate through values and rally your fans behind you for what you stand for, not what city you're born in or what city you happen to kind of start in. So I think, I'm, I, and I, I would be sad if that sort of that level of kind of innovation falls away. So I, I think I'm, I'm kind of, there's opportunity um, on both sides. Um, so I'm a bit undecided. I'm, I'm looking forward to how this plays out. But I, I would not say that regionalization is the answer to kind of uh, everything. It should be the kind of plain path that this is going forward on. Cool. Maybe esports will unite the world. Let's leave it at that. <laughs> Thanks so much. I think our time's up. It's been a pleasure. For more gaming stuff, we have press play happening tomorrow. It's a side event, so check that out. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs>